Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back after our recess. We'll reconvene council now. We do have quorum in chambers, so we will move on to next item, which is 1B, uh, presentation on single-use items and consultation launch. Mr. Seamus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Albert Seamus, Director of Waste Management Resource Recovery. And I'm here today to talk about our strategy development process for single-use items and the challenges around dealing with single-use items in the public realm. I'll cover basically a summary of the issues, some of the actions that are underway in the community already, the level of city regulatory authority, and then what we are proposing for next steps. Single-use items are an issue for a lot of governments around the world, from municipal to provincial to national governments. So we're all trying to address the challenges that these items create when they're thrown away. They represent a significant amount of wasted resources that could be recovered and used in other areas. The main focus in, in uh, I guess, the world at this point on these issues is around disposable cups, cups um, takeout containers and shopping bags. And they are the most prevalent items that we find within our litter. So when we look at some of the, the key items, we get about 44% of the large litter items, which are the ones that are over four inches in size, that are made up by plastic or paper shopping bags, takeout food containers and cups and sleeves. And it's costing us just for those products to about two, two and a half million dollars a year to collect those materials from the public waste bins and as litter in our, our parks, our streets and, and in the green spaces. The cups, lids and sleeves, and this is all types of drink cups, it's, uh, it's the uh, coffee cups, the cold drink cups, and they make up about 22% of the total amount of large litter that we do collect. And some interesting statistics about every week, there's about 2.6 million polycoat paper cups, which are the, uh, the hot drink paper cups that are thrown away in Vancouver. Uh, plus, we don't know, but there are many more uh, plastic and polystyrene cups as well. Takeout packaging makes up about 19% of the street litter. And small foam pieces, it's one of the challenges of some of the takeout food packaging that's made from styrofoam is it does break apart. And those small pieces of styrofoam do tend to get into waterways and into False Creek and into some of the shoreline around the city. And over 2 million shopping bags are thrown into the garbage each year. Now, the, the interesting fact about that is of those 2 million that are thrown into the garbage, over 60% of them are reused as garbage bags. So they do have a second use. They're not technically single use in that case, uh, but they still do end up in the garbage. We also find that uh, in our public realm, 2% is plastic, 1% is paper. Litter in the shoreline is about 3% bags. And when we look at the issues of paper versus plastic bags, well, paper bags are less persistent. They do break down in the environment. They do biodegrade and can be composted. Uh, they do have some other impacts that are, are significant in greenhouse gas emissions, renewable energy use, and water use. Plastic bags tend to be much uh, less expensive. They are much less uh, polluting to produce, but they still have their own issues. A number of actions going on in the community already. There are many grocers in the, in the lower mainland area that have started to charge fees on bags or offer discounts for reusable bags. We know that some coffee shops charge fees on disposable cups or offer discounts on travel mugs. Some restaurants charge fees on takeout containers or they offer discounts for bringing reusable dishware on site. There is some challenges with that and I'll speak about that in, in a moment. Many of the nonprofit social service agencies are use, use, reuse, excuse me, use reusable dishware and businesses are adopting recyclable and compostable alternatives. So we do see a lot of action happening in the community at the present time. Uh, some of the things that we're doing, we have uh, supported in the past the coffee cup revolution that's been run by the Binners Society, or Binners Project. We also, as part of our Keep Vancouver Spectacular program, we run a number of electronics drop-off events in the city. We've worked with the Binners Project to include them in those events um, and to collect the paper cups and offer a deposit for those paper, paper cups at that time. So we're working closely with them to try and expand the coverage on the return of those, of those cups for reuse or recycling. We're working on uh, expanding our on-street recycling program with Recycle BC. We've been doing that for the past year in the Davy Denman uh, 
horseshoe corridor down there and we're looking to expand that to a few more locations in the downtown BIA. And what we're finding with that is it's working quite well. The people are, are quite good at putting in the proper materials into the proper containers. I don't have all the details on tonnage yet. That's still, uh, still under review and uh, reports are being prepared. But anecdotally, it seems to be going quite well. We're also looking at the procurement policies of the city so that we can lead by example. So for things like in our parks department where we have concessions and where we had food service uh, locations, is to look at what sort of containers are we using, what sort of cups are we using, what sort of cutlery to try and find environmentally friendly, compostable, recyclable alternatives. One interesting thing we're working on with Vancouver uh, Coastal Health is a bring your own container pilot. And what that would mean is that residents would be able to bring their own uh, food containers to take their takeout material away in. There are some health related risks to that. So by working with Vancouver Coastal Health and modeling some of the things that have been done in New York around this, we think that we can develop a structure and a strategy that will allow us to expand the use of reusable containers in uh, fast food restaurants and the bring your own container option for residents. When we look at single use items in our, our regulatory authority, we actually have quite, amount of, uh, quite a significant amount of control. We can require businesses to prompt customers for reusable alternatives. We can require businesses to set up in-store recycling. We can use graduated business license fees. We can ban the distribution of certain materials. We can ban disposal within the solid waste system. Some of the things that we don't have specific authority to do that we would have to rely on the province are areas such as fees on single-use items or requiring refunds and deposits. When we looked at other jurisdictions, we found there was a wide variety of initiatives undertaken and, and um, with varying degrees of success. So San, Seattle, San Francisco, LA and California do have plastic bag bans in, in effect and they do charge fees on paper bags. Montreal, Portland, Austin, France, Rwanda, parts of Australia have plastic bags in, in, in effect. Victoria, BC is consulting on this now as uh, we are proposing to do. Chicago and Washington, Ontario, UK, EU, Hong Kong have fees. Uh, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, France, San, I'm trying to have trouble talking to her today. Must be the stress of the early events. <laughs> the, um, so over 100 US cities have banned polystyrene foam containers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the Bring Your Own Container pilot, uh, New York has a program where they set up a, uh, a health code to deal with reusable containers for takeout food. Um, there are a number of reusable mug share programs that are being developed now, and uh, New York has one that they're implementing. Germany, there's, uh, there's some, Portland, San Francisco. So as we're going through the process of assessing what's happening, we've looked worldwide to see what sort of options there may be available for the city of Vancouver. What we learned is for Vancouver specifically, whatever actions we take on these, it affects 10,000 businesses and basically all areas of society and every resident in the city. We found that strong regulatory approaches may have unintended consequences and may in the end not move the dial forward on these issues. Some cities that started with plastic bag bans have actually gone to fees because they find that the fees are, are resulting in a greater change and less stress on the public and the business community. And what we believe is that there's no single approach that will result in the changes that we needed around all of these items that we're discussing. And when we've done our zero waste consultation, we had one single session on, uh, on single use items. And it was very clear from the discussions with the business leaders, with the uh, community representatives and the broad representative society that's, that are part of that group, that a consultative, cooperative, collaborative approach to how we deal with this will be important as we move forward towards achieving our zero waste goals. Things like foster innovation, strong circular economy are all things that are very important as we move forward in dealing with zero waste in the future. Some of the emerging directions that, that we see based on the research that we've done, fees, either voluntary or mandatory, have a significant effect immediately on reducing the amount of materials in the, in the waste stream. There are some places that have had success with bans on distribu distribution and use. Education and promotion is a very important part of moving forward. The reuse part of it, I think actually as we move forward towards zero waste, becomes very important in making the transition from the society we've developed over many years into the new zero waste society. Things that could start easily are things like mandatory customer prompts and businesses around reusable alternatives. 
behavior change initiatives, which we're already undertaking as part of our zero waste program, and mug share, container share programs are all uh, valuable alternatives. When we look at recycling and composting, deposits, disposal bans, uh, mandatory in front of store recycling or composting, um, requiring standards that are associated with recyclable materials or compostable materials, all things that we can do. One of the areas that we have to work with other groups on is if, if we're going to look at compostable alternatives, there are no standards in place at the t this time as to what a compostable alternative would be. And there would have to be some discussions with the processors to make sure that we have a good standard material that will break down within the reasonable amount of time and will produce a usable compost. So what we're proposing to do is to go out and consult with stakeholders over the next few months and then eventually come back to council with a report and recommendations on what we believe the best way forward is. What we need to look at with the stakeholders is voluntary programs versus city regulations. What cooperative opportunities may be there between the city and the business community, the, com the public? Uh, what areas are most important to focus on? Setting targets and timelines to achieve results and finding ways to accurately measure results, including collection of data and reporting on the information in progress. As I mentioned before, it's very important to consider the, the, the broad reach of the initiatives that we would work on in this, um, dealing with these materials. And so it involves all sectors of society. So when we look at developing a zero waste community, which includes these materials, it's not only government, it's business and industry, institutions, hospitals, medical care facilities, not-for-profit groups, residents, First Nations. It's a broad spectrum of people that we need to talk to. We're proposing that we will undertake a series of consultations through developing a paper outlining our uh, proposals, initiatives, the, the options available to us doing roundtable meetings with stakeholders, receiving correspondence from any stakeholder that wishes to put in information, and in addition, engaging the community through our citizen advisory panels, the uh, pop-up city halls, special events, social media surveys, uh, through the website, doing a Talk Vancouver survey, and we're reaching out to as many people as possible. We'd like to get at least 5,000 touch points on this. Consultation timeline to give you a sense of how we see it unfolding should, we, uh, should you approve going forward with this, this approach is that we would start the consultations or continue the consultations that we actually began in October of last year, go to a much more focused set of consultations beginning in June, uh, beginning late this uh, basis. Actually, we're already starting it to later this week. Uh, start the community engagement in July and August stakeholder roundtable meetings in September. The reason we're suggesting September is that the feedback from stakeholders is that's the best time to get everybody together. And then we would be coming back to council in the late fall to present the results. And so through the consultation, what we're going to do is identify the impacts, barriers, trade-offs, um, or the options under consideration, the potential unintended consequences, because all of these things, the actions that we take could have varying degrees of unintended consequences um, as we move forward. Look for the opportunities for collaboration and find other potential options that we may not have thought about that other members of the community are already starting. We we'll do this in order to provide recommendations to council of the best way to move forward as we continue to build a movement towards becoming a zero waste community. One of the key areas of societal change that we need to address as we move down the road to zero waste and as we deal with these single-use items is a transition from a linear economy which is basically extract resources, design products, produce them, put them into use, at the end of the use throw them away. We need to look more at a circular economy which involves looking at each stage of the, the extraction, design, production, distribution, sale, consumption and disposal points to find ways that those materials could be recovered and used in the production of new materials or repurposed. So circular economy is becoming more and more important as we move forward towards zero waste. The challenges that we're dealing with have been decades in the making. This particular advertisement from 1954, which uh, I'll date myself a little bit, that was the year I was born. And so we can, we can see that these, these Opportunity. These situations have taken decades to develop. It's not something we can change overnight. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, societal patterns that have developed around these, these um, single-use items. A lot of them relate to, relate to concerns around health. They relate to convenience. They relate to a number of factors that have made it easy to adopt these single-use products. And what we really are hoping to do is to seek community input, help us to develop creative, sustainable solutions 
that will work in Vancouver and that may even provide models for other areas. And of course, it's time to shift our thinking about waste and I would be pleased to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Seamus. First, we have Councillor DiGenovo with some questions. Thank you very much. I did have some questions regarding single use items and uh, I suppose your thoughts on particular items that I foresee being an issue. I know tourists is one of them, but uh, more so thinking about people in the downtown east side in the food lines who are, f who are fed often on disposable plates or with disposable uh, containers so that they can take some of that food away and have that for a second meal. I just see it problematic asking them to bring their own clean container. Would you be able to perhaps yes. shed some light on yeah, that? And that's a very important consideration. We've reached out to some of the social agencies in the downtown east side and the feedback we've had is very much that sort of approach. If we were to go down the road of banning some of these materials, it would create significant problems for them. So what we want to do is continue that discussion about how can we actually work together to find alternatives that will work in those situations. It may be better to look at how could we recover those for recycling than look at restrictions on use. Okay. And so those are the sorts of things we really need to hear about. That's why I think it's very important to consult with the community. There are so many things like that that we may not be aware of as we go through this process of trying to deal thing with things and we're trying to identify as many of them as possible. I just think of another hub or center in our city uh, that I, I've been spending a lot of time at BC Women's Hospital mm -hmm. lately, mm -hmm. but uh, there they use single-use disposable diapers. I know yep. everywhere from their NICU all the way up. So I'm just wondering, I understand that there are choices out there, although some find them more expensive to do disposable diapers or don't have the resources or the time, uh, would that be a ban on because it is a single use item or is that something again where it would sort of have to be looked at that sort of the biggest women's hospital in all of Canada might be allowed to use them but they'd be banned in Vancouver stores. How would we, would, would the policy have to blanket across the city of Vancouver or would special exceptions be made for, for instance, a hospital or? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I think um, diapers are really outside of the scope of what we're talking about in this, in this initiative. However, that, use, so I had yeah, to that, that, being, that being said, it's a very challenging area and there's been attempts in the past to set up recycling programs for diapers that have never been able to get off the ground. There are significant health issues related to using reusable diapers in hospitals, in, even for cancer patients in the home when they're on treatment. And so those are things that really part of the unintended consequences when we look at some of the some of the challenges that we have to deal with around these things. So it's very important that we, when we go forward with uh, such far-reaching initiatives that we do have that feedback and we do make allowances for some of those special use situations. Of course. Another question I have is bringing your own container. You've mentioned that it works in New York and some other cities or it's been implemented. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, sort of with some of my history in the event production business, I remember several times that for an event or even at a fancy hotel, there's lots of food left over, mm -hmm. but there's all of, always the lawyers and the liability and assuming the risk of food safe and this and that. So I wonder if some restaurants wouldn't be comfortable with that because there's food safe issues around cleaning your own containers properly and then who assumes the risk if someone gets sick. So I'm just wondering if that's something you're consulting with Vancouver Coastal Health on. Yeah, exactly. It's those health-related issues that are most important when we consider that program. And even so, I would think that if we went down the road for that sort of a thing, it couldn't be universal because not everybody is willing to carry around their own container. Not everybody is willing to take the risk from a health perspective in those situations. And so that's, it may be an option that works in some locations that people have that alternative to participate in, but it may not be something that would be universal. Okay, so restaurants shouldn't worry that they will have to do that in single-use no, containers. No, and, and you know, we've been in discussion with the Restaurant Association of, uh, of Canada, BC Restaurants Association, and the small business community around the need to collaborate and find solutions that are, are more workable across the board. And that's why I say that we may need more than one intervention. Okay. It may not just be a one-size-fits-all. It may have to be... Uh, a suite of interventions that deal with some of these very unique situations. Okay, and then also uh, my next question, well, I'm going to throw them both at you at once because of my time's uh, running out, but regarding tourists, uh, has Tourism Vancouver or any other organizations been consulted? I would assume that if uh, single-use items were to be allowed, prices may go up for those instead of using a container. Uh, 
just was hoping for your comments on that. And then the second question is regarding affordability in the city of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose uh, in the long run, it may pay off. And uh, I know that using your own container certainly does. Uh, but that being said, some people don't have access to that or have forgotten theirs, and they would be forced to pay that extra fee. Mm -hmm. if they wanted to get a cup of coffee in the morning. So if you could touch about affordability in this tourists mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I so I think the majority of the the coffee shops now that deal with people bringing their reusable containers actually offer a discount for that as opposed to charging a fee for a for a paper cup and, and you know so those are the sorts of things we'll be discussing with the with the stakeholders tourism vancouver is definitely on the list we've been working very closely with them on our keep vancouver spectacular program so they're one of the key stakeholders and, and so the the other issue that you mentioned is affordability and that's a very important consideration too particularly as we deal with the lower income parts of of the city and um, you know I believe uh, in the past we've discussed the issue of well even if there's bag fees how does it affect the lower income people in the downtown east side or the this, the margins of society and those so those will have to be discussions as well and I think you know so far the grocery stores have been very flexible uh, they've they've implemented their fee but they've been very flexible with low income and it's stuff that we'll have to talk about as we go down the road right thank you very much next we have Councillor Ball Yes, thank you very much. I'm very glad to hear about the consultation because we might get all kinds of ideas that actually encourage people to do this, you know, because I know lots of times people don't want to for good reasons, but maybe we can help them. And one of the questions I had was in Europe during Christmas time, there at all the festivals, uh, they don't use styrofoam cups or, or polycoat cups, they use ceramic mugs. And you buy the ceramic mug when you buy your glue wine uh, at the festival mm -hmm. and it's about 750 which is about 16 17 dollars uh, to have a cup of wine but they're reused and reused and reused and obviously the price goes down as you reuse them people hook them onto their belts with carabiners mm -hmm. and i was fascinated to see this process and i thought how can you afford this and how can you afford to sell them so cheaply and every city told me that it was done through the government. The government procured them uh, through their ability to get hundreds of thousands, because really they are using hundreds of thousands, and putting that city's uh, coat of arms or name or, or some photograph that meant that, that it became a souvenir, a genuine souvenir for tourists. So would we be able to, as a city, uh, use our procurement to help our festivals? do that kind of a changeover? Would that be possible? I think it's worked in other situations in the past, particularly around our change to the green bin mm -hmm. and some of our recycling issues where we have supported some of the waste haulers in procuring advertising and allowing them to participate in getting beneficial pricing around uh, kitchen catchers if they want to go into multifamily. So I, I think it's definitely something that could work and we can add it to our list of things to consult on with the stakeholders to see how something that, like that could unfold. That's great. Thank you because I've been asked that by festivals year after year. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful. Thank you mm -hmm. very much and mm -hmm. thank you for all the information and thank you for talking to Coastal Health. I think that's wonderful and continuing that conversation about hospital services and cafeterias mm -hmm. I think is a, a great idea. So thank you. Next, we have Councillor Carr. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. And thank you so much for the, re for the report. It's always um, fascinating to get the updates on this. And uh, certainly, it's a big item of public concern. So um, I know there's lots of people who want to see a ban, an outright ban, um, off, for example, on thin, thin, thin plastic bags, mm -hmm. cups, etc. Um, so is it that um, you, you, don't you, you anticipate the unanticipated consequences of a ban um, being not worth the ban, i.e. that people who use those plastic bags for um, garbage might just go out and purchase plastic bags for garbage and so therefore not reduce really the mm -hmm. use of plastic bags? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a few issues that um, have come up in some locations where bans have been put in place. For the most part, the bans are based on the thickness of a plastic shopping bag from a grocery store, which are quite thin. And so when they've banned the bags, what they've found is actually people then just go to thicker bags. And the net 
result is that they haven't reduced the amount of plastic that's ending up in the waste stream at all. The other unintended consequence is just as we mentioned, they would go away from a plastic shopping bag to a kitchen catcher type of bag, which again, doesn't really reduce the amount of plastic that we're dealing with. Where the, the cities that have done the bans initially and gone more to the fees, like Chicago, what they found was that the, the fees actually resulted in a more immediate and significant reduction than trying to implement the ban did. As people were then thinking about, well, do we want to pay this extra for a bag, even though it may be only five or 10 cents. It does tend to make think, people stop and think mm -hmm. and then understand, well, if I buy a reusable bag for a dollar, then I've paid it back in, in uh, 10 uses. Right. So. Are, have some cities gone with a ban and maintain that ban, and how is it working in those cities? Yeah, I think there, there have been some. And I would say that, in, in my mind, the jury's still a little bit out on that because the bans are, are more recent, and it's going to take a little bit more time to see how those unfold in the long term. Right. And is there some, something that we can uh, perhaps promote or do basically around culture shifts? So, for example, those really thin plastic bags that you get in the grocery, um, the fresh grocery section, so the fruits and vegetables, those kinds of things. Like I know from other countries, people do not put their tomatoes or whatever, potatoes, in, in a plastic, one plastic mm -hmm. bag that then goes into mm -hmm. another plastic bag. Um, so was there a way to differentiate and somehow find some solutions in educating people? You can just put five potatoes on a weighing tray and, and then they put it in your, your cotton plastic mm -hmm. or your cotton shopping mm -hmm. bag. Yeah, I think there are some significant societal and cultural changes that are needed to, to do that, to move away from the convenience of a plastic bag. Some places have gone to paper bags. You know, as I mentioned, there's some other challenges around paper bags. It's not necessarily a better option. It's just a different option. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what's, what's happened, and the reason we see a lot of these bags in use now, tends to relate to more around food security and the concerns around foodborne illness mm. than it does to anything else. And those are things that, you know, we can explore with stakeholders as we go down the road with coastal health. And, and again, go back to the issue around why we think it's very important to talk to the community and to talk to stakeholders about what the options are, what the opportunities are, so that we can gear, gear up for these changes that will occur over time. Mm -hmm. And given that it's taken so many decades to get where we are, we're not going to turn it around overnight, in my opinion. We need to make these sustainable incremental changes. And over time, people won't notice that they've actually gone to a totally different right. way of doing business. Are we planning to consult with school children? Uh, elementary, middle school, seniors, etc. Seniors. That's a really interesting thought. We haven't had that um, on our plan at this point, have we? It's not. It's not something that's come up. We've been focused more on the general public and the stakeholders. But let us and school. Let us take that away and, and see what we can do on yeah. that because it's they're, a very they're good They're the point. ones who are open, and mm -hmm. they're going to be the shoppers. Well, we always talk about, you know, get to the kids in the schools with yeah, this information yeah. and they'll take it home. So, okay. yeah, let it, leave, it, leave that with us. Great, thank you. Um, can we do anything around stores that really overpackage? I'm not going to name names, but I think some of us know the stores that have one package and then they have a box around a number of packages and then they have a plastic bag around the box. And can we, how can we approach those stores in terms of their over packaging mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that's a that's a bigger zero waste issue i mm -hmm. think that we'll have to deal with as we go forward and you know there's some of the packing materials are recyclable the cardboard certainly is and you know we've got to look at how we can manage that more in the future and I, I think the trend is packaging yeah and i think the trend is as more and more people order things online that there is more and more package associated with those online products mm -hmm. because they they tend to get banged around a lot so. okay thank you yeah Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Ratner. Chairperson, I don't have questions. I was prepared to move the motion. I see no further questions, so happy to receive your motion. Uh, thank you. So I'll move the recommendation from staff in the report that Council receive this report for information and direct staff to report back with the results of the single-use item strategy, stakeholder consultation, and public engagement. I might add a few words if you'll indulge me. Uh, you know, it's been a long road to get to this point. It is not a road that did not have a significant amount of work on it. Um, some of that work is in the form of 
the massive reductions that staff have been able to achieve on other items, so the heavy and bulky items, the mattresses, the demolition waste, the food, uh, wasted food and diverting that. Um, this morning we heard about the 27% reduction in uh, waste going to landfill or incinerator, so that, that, that's a chunk of the work that's been on that road. Um, but then, of course, the other challenge on this road is that we have extraordinarily limited fiscal tools available to us when we hear about these demand management tools that other um, cities, states, countries are using. I know I get emails, I'm sure we all do all the time about them, and it's challenging to explain to residents why we don't have access to those. Um, and of course, that legislative authority that does exist for some of those is spread across regional, federal, provincial, so it's not, it's not even one person we have to go talk to or even one government. So I appreciate that it's been a huge amount of tenacity, creativity, innovation, and particularly collaboration. It was fantastic to see in the presentation just a few glimpses into the kinds of collaborations that you've been pulling together to get a better understanding about within this tiny little space that we can operate as a city, um, what's possible to achieve when we're collaborating with other agencies. So I'm very pleased to see it moving forward to the next step. Um, I don't think we would be able to be at this step without the creativity and tenacity that you've shown. So I did want to rise to thank you for that. Thank and you. looking forward to the report back in the fall. Thank you, Councillor Reimer. Councillor Carr. Yes, I'm happy to second, um, uh, second the motion of the recommendations um, and also thank staff and just say I'm very excited about the consultations that are going to take place. I think that this is, I think this is a topic that a lot of people are really interested in. And so there's, um, I said the more robust we can be in terms of that outreach, as I say, including, including kids where it, it like, Sometimes in families it starts with the kids who say, why are we, you know, tossing that away or why are we using that instead of, you know, a, uh, a, a nice shopping, like cloth shopping bag usable. Um, so I, I'm, and I think there's some big challenges around businesses too um, in terms of the, especially the, the single disposable cups and, and, um, and uh, food uh, containers that, um, I don't have, I don't know the answers to, but I am sure interested in knowing what people from the industry uh, are going to come back with in terms of, of, of solutions. So I'm, I'm very excited for it, uh, for the process that we're about to in, embark upon, and uh, and grateful for your support, and grateful for all the work that's been done on this because it's a, it is a big item. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll move to the voting queue. All votes are in. We have a unanimous vote in support. Thank you, everyone. Next item is <clears throat> 1C, and we'll have a presentation on 1D at the same time, which is the curbside electric vehicle charging pilot program and user fees for city-owned and operated public electric vehicle charging stations. Mr. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Mr. Smith, you're not Mr. Neville. I'm not Mr. Neville. However, I'm just going to introduce Mr. Neville. Okay. Um, so, as you can see, we had two uh, presentations in the interest of efficiency, which is really important for sustainability. We've combined them into uh, a single presentation. The first half will be done by Ian Neville, and he'll be talking to you about user fees. And then the second half will be a curbside EV charging pilot program uh, by um, Brad Bedelt. And then we'll get into the questions and then the reports. Okay. So I'm going to ask Ian to come up and get into the presentation. It's automatic now. I know. That's, can I get the mic high enough? Yeah, okay, there we are. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair, Council. Uh, I'm Ian Neville. I'm the Climate Policy Analyst in the uh, Sustainability Group. As uh, Doug mentioned, we will be presenting uh, two, uh, two reports on electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, I'll be talking to user fees, and in particular, I, I wanted to point out that both of these reports are actions that um, resulted out of the EV ecosystem strategy that was approved last November. Oh, where am I? Oh, there it is. Okay. 
Um, so first report, user fees uh, for city-owned and operated electric vehicle charging stations uh, essentially has two components. The, the first is that council amend the parking meter bylaw. Uh, these amendments will define EV charging stations as a type of parking meter and what the rules for on-street parking at EV charging stations will be. Uh, council will, of course, recall that the parking meter bylaw applies to on-street parking uh, but does not cover off-street lots. The second recommendation, which stems from the first, is that Council approve a supply and demand model for pricing electric vehicle charging stations that are owned and operated by the City. This model would apply not only to EV charging stations that are placed on street, uh, but also to EV charging stations that are off street uh, that are owned by the City. So last summer when we were putting together the EV ecosystem strategy, we, we did run um, a survey of the public uh, and we determined through that that 85% of the respondents uh, would definitely be buying their next vehicle as an electric vehicle or would plan on buying it. Um, the plan on was based on us being able to remove or the removal of uh, a number of key barriers that we identified. Uh, also identified during that same survey was that uh, approximately 50% of all the respondents supported the introduction of user fees. This was fairly consistent across the demographics we looked at, including EV owners, prospective EV owners, um, residents that were waiting to pick up an EV, as well as people that, that don't drive electric vehicles, so about 50-50. Uh, the, interestingly, the, uh, the current EV drivers were more supportive than those who are near future owners, uh, likely because they understand the reality of the challenges of not charging user, user fees and the, the current state of the, the uh, charging network. I'll come back to that in a moment. The use of our charging stations is on the rise. Uh, last year we saw 17, over 17,000 uh, charging sessions uh, across 16 key locations. These averaged about three hours per session in most locations, which is about twice as long as was actually required to get to a fully charged battery. Uh, this increase also represents a near doubling in usage over, uh, since 2015. And uh, considering that this is only at a handful of locations, uh, this number represents thousands of sessions at each location over the course of the year. Again, as mentioned last November, or as brought to your attention, uh, we have identified a number of barriers to EV adoption in Vancouver. Um, those, are, those are listed above. Uh, today, we're really looking to address the first two, um, a, a lack of home charging access and a, a charging uh, network that does not meet current users' needs, especially those that don't have home charging ac access. The EV ecosystem strategy itself is structured to, among other things, incubate a business case for EV infrastructure. Both of, both of the reports today are addressing the growing market of electric vehicles. The introduction of user fees will, in addition, be the beginning of the city's being able to get a return on its infrastructure investment. And for perspective, we estimate that right now electric vehicles only represent about 1% of the vehicles on the road, um, but we have seen a consistently high increases in that number, with the number of EVs in BC going up 10% in the first quarter of this year. Um, under our EV ecosystem strategy, we do have a four, full, or four I should say, three-pillared uh, strategy. Um, the user fees component of it is an action that was specified uh, to improve the public charging network. User fees are proposed for this primary purpose, to allow for fair and greater access to, pub to the public charging network. The development of a user fee system was guided by these six principles, to increase the turnover at EV charging stations, to have a charging system that is easy for the public and particularly new EV users to understand, to encourage those people who have access to home and or workplace charging to use those as much as possible, to obtain a return on the city's investment in infrastructure, to promote fairness in access to public infrastructure, and to retain the attractiveness of the low operating costs of an electric vehicle when compared with fossil fuel vehicles. We are looking at an hourly rate for our model. Uh, it is a familiar form. People understand parking by the hour, and we will be continuing that mode with EV user fees that are proportional to the power output of the station, but priced per hour to improve that, that experience and to improve that understanding. It's essentially an add-on fee. Uh, the price for non-EV charging spots on the same block or parking lot uh, will be lower, uh, further encouraging turn turnover by encouraging people to go to something that's not a charging station if they don't need it. Charging stations we work with accept their own member cards, they accept credit cards, and they work with smartphone apps. EV drivers without these options can also call into the station's network provider and pay for by credit card over the phone, so it's a very accessible system similar to our current parking meter setup. 
The network providers that manage the data uh, are also working towards a roaming system so that one card can work at different locations basically throughout North America. And under this system, we are still confirming things like uh, credit card security, uh, technology readiness of our, of our network, which is nearly complete now, and finalizing how we will work with Easy Park uh, for our off-street lots. So this report proposes an initial fee of $2 per hour plus any applicable parking fee for level two charging stations. It also proposes an initial fee of $16 per hour at DC fast charging stations plus any applicable parking fees. For comparison, a vehicle charging on a level two circuit on a residential context would consume about 86 cents per hour and receive about 30 kilometers of range for every hour that they are plugged in. An individual charging at a public level two station would receive the same range per hour, but at a higher cost. And the cost for using a DC fast charger is higher again per hour, but the value in using it is quite a lot higher, getting um, about seven times the range in that hour that you're plugged in. In all three of these scenarios, there'll be some variations on the electricity dispense per hour based on the individual vehicle at any given moment. The system is designed such that fees will continue being charged after a battery is fully charged, creating a reason uh, and encouragement for, uh, to free up that infrastructure for those that are still waiting to use it. Uh, it should be reminded too that while there are some variations in how this works, fossil fuel vehicles have similar challenges in that driving habits, weather, altitude, and so forth can affect uh, the performance of, of a given fuel and the value you get per dollar. The pricing model that we're proposing is already in use for our parking meters. We have target usage, ra usage ranges, uh, which will dictate any changes to pricing and are based on supply and demand. In a no-fee scenario, or where fees are not high enough to create greater infrastructure availability, we find that many stations are fully occupied and not available, a situation we see throughout a lot of our network right now. This likely includes many people who have access to home charging but choose not to the, choose the public network anyway because it's free at the moment and often cheaper in other locations. This is problematic as it means that stations are not available to other users and are not seen as being available who is, to anyone who's considering switching over to an electric vehicle. In short, if someone is thinking about switching to an EV, sees that all the charging stations that they would rely on are unavailable, they'd probably reconsider. Similarly, if we set the pricing too high, we expect that many people would avoid using the stations, essentially reducing the number of zero emission kilometers that can be driven. This is also undesirable, so we've created this flexible system to allow us to understand where the price sensitivities are and, and to allow it to adjust as the market expands. Uh, we also expect that as we expand our offerings of infrastructure that how people respond to prices will change and so it will be continuously um, adjusted as, as the needs uh, occur. In the end, our goal in introducing user fees is to create a public network that provides flexible options for EV users through available charging points while at the same time ensuring that one of the significant benefits of an EV, which is low fueling costs, remain. Next, I'm going to introduce Brad Bedell to, to speak about curbside charging. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Brad Bedelt. I'll be speaking to the curbside EV charging pilot, which, as Ian noted, uh, was identified as an early action in the EV ecosystem strategy adopted late last fall. So there are three recommendations before you in the, the pilot report. The first is to approve the proposed curbside EV charging pilot program, which I'll explain in more detail in this presentation. Secondly, authorizing the use of a license agreement uh, to enable the placement of private infrastructure in the public realm as part of the pilot program. And third, for staff to report back to Council in two years' time on the outcomes of the pilot. Before I get into the details of, of the pilot program itself, I'll briefly touch upon the context and the key drivers for the creation of this program. So according to our GIS mapping, there are over 2,000 one- and two-family homes in Vancouver that do not have access to off-street parking. That means they don't have a driveway and they don't have a garage, and so they're forced to park on the street. These are often referred to as garage orphans. For these residents, uh, the lack of at-home charging is a significant barrier to purchasing an electric vehicle. Over the last couple of years, we've received a number of requests from these residents to enable them to install curbside charging infrastructure. And we've had several do-it-yourself uh, installations, much like the one you see in this photo showing an overhead swing arm installation. Uh, unfortunately, we've had to have those removed because we haven't had a, a process by which to permit these, these types of installations. 
similarly, over the last couple of years, we've had several businesses approach us who are interested in installing curbside charging in front of their businesses, fed off of their own electrical supply. Again, they're seeking a process to enable them to do this. They're not seeking the city to, to cost share or to, to really support their installation. And they're, they're indicating that this is a way of showing corporate leadership to install such a, a charger in front of their business. The pilot program in front of you was developed uh, through sustainability and consultation and partnership with other departments, most notably engineering. We also worked closely with the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association to get their input as we developed it and looked at best practices in other cities across North America that have tackled this challenge in different ways and tried to pick and choose the best practices that we saw. There's really two streams to the pilot program. The first is a non-residential program. This would be for commercial, retail, industrial users. The second is for the residential uh, applicants, really focused on the garage orphans. The pilot would be open for two years, so applications would be received for a period of two years, but the actual license agreements themselves would be for a term of five years. The reason we're setting it at five years is to ensure that the homeowner who is paying to have this station installed is getting a reasonable period of, of usage out of that, uh, out of that in infrastructure. It's worth reiterating that for the residential application, it would be limited to, to one and two family homes that do not have access to off-street parking. A homeowner that comes forward that has converted their garage into an, an at-home office or, or a gym would not be eligible for this program. Similarly, a homeowner that simply prefers to park on the street for convenience would not be eligible for this program. So public space for the charger is really the last resort. This table provides a summary of the key elements of the, of the two streams of the pilot program. So the number of installations that we're proposing are five for the non-residential and 15 for the residential. Those numbers were selected uh, thinking that th they would meet the anticipated demand over the two-year period, that they would be sufficient for us to truly evaluate how effective the program is, but also would limit our, our risk. This is a very new program. It, it truly is a pilot. And so we felt that by uh, establishing a maximum number that we would, we would be able to contain our risk on that. If the program proves to be uh, unquestionably successful after the first year, we could consider adding a few uh, additional applications at that time. The level of charger that would be permitted for the non-residential applicant would be either a level two or a fast charger. It would be at the discretion of the applicant as to which they would prefer but it would also be very much constrained by the location itself. So a retail location along Robson Street, likely not suitable for a fast charger, likely limited to a, to a level two just due to the space constraints. For the residential applicants, they'll have the option of either a level one or level two outlet. A level one is, is the standard outlet in your home that you would plug a hairdryer or a lawnmower into. A level two is, again, a fairly standard outlet, uh, something that a clothes dryer would plug into. Either one of these would be within a lockbox, just as a safety precaution. In terms of access, the non-residential chargers would be public access, and they would be free. The businesses are not able, under the Utilities Act, to charge for electricity, so the power would be free for those who choose to use it. For the residential, it would be private use only. Again, the homeowner can't sell that power, so we would see it as being with a lockbox and for that homeowner's use. In terms of the cost, both the installation and the maintenance costs under both streams would be borne by the applicant throughout the process. In terms of next steps, if Council does adopt the pilot program, we would activate a web page uh, to, to provide information for applicants. We have a, a guidelines prepared already that outlines uh, the permitting process, the insurance requirements, the details the applicant would need to go through to get one of these stations installed or, or install one of these stations. Secondly, we'd be getting the word out through our website, also through organizations like the Vancouver Electric Vehicles Association, so that the public is aware that this program exists. And then finally, after the two-year program, staff would report back to Council on the outcomes of it, on the uptake, on the effectiveness, and on any challenges that we've encountered at that time. That concludes our presentation. Ian and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We have some questions. Councillor Cars first. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Acting Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, an interest of, of mine, and uh, I have to say my decision to not purchase an EV was simply that I could not 
in my condo get charging. Um, so I think that this is a, a bigger problem than we probably anticipate. My first question, where are those stations that were like the most used, 13 hours a day? Just curiosity as to where the popular neighborhoods are. So the most popular one is actually, uh, there's two, they're located at Mainland and Nelson. Mainland and Nelson. So they're, they're curbside locations. They're actually the most used charging stations in the whole province and it is 13 hours per day per port. Fantastic. West End. <laughs> okay. Um, secondly, in terms of the um, the charging, I mean, I, I you know I know that a fast charge you can charge up your battery 30, 40 minutes. Are we charging by the minute? It's not it's sixteen dollars an hour, but is there a minute by minute like you know? Absolutely, yeah. No, it's. I mean, we we put out per hour for sort of ease of understanding, right. but but it'll actually be calculated per minute. Okay, so convince me of this. I, I'm worried that we're still in an adopter phase where we're trying to entice people to give up a gas, you know, fired vehicle for an EV. And for a lot of those people, lowering their fuel cost is a big enticement. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to get a lot of money from this. What, 23500 is what the city revenues are mm -hmm. estimated to be. So why are we charging? Like, can't we just that comes to pay for the meter, but why aren't we still providing it for in this early stage of adoption um, for free? Well, I would, uh, two points on that. I would say that we are in, in many cases, I think moving past that adoption phase now. I mean, we are kind of moving into an early core market um, and the congestion we see sort of suggests that. Um, in terms of uh, why we wouldn't offer it for free, I think as the number of vehicles gets out there, I think it's, it's good. We still want to encourage other forms of transportation first and offering basically free transportation fuel is probably not in the interest of our broader transportation policies. Um, but we just feel that this is sort of the best way to encourage turnover. And, and to your question as to whether we don't just charge a meter rate, the idea is, again, to encourage people to move to maybe an adjacent parking meter or to another part of the lot so that that equipment is freed up when, they, when people don't require it. Right. And, and also, sorry, just to, to encourage people to use home charging if they do have yeah. that. So that's another question I have around fairness. I mean, it seems to me like those people who own their own home and have off-street parking, you know, they get to pay whatever their electricity rate is, and it's probably it's lower than I would expect this $16 an hour charge to be. So are we unfairly penalizing those who simply aren't single-family homeowners with garages? And there is certainly an equity argument to be made. Um, the pricing that we've come to is higher than the utility rate, and again, that's to encourage those people who have home charging to use it. Um, but if you equate it to what it would be equivalent to gasoline, it's still less than ha half the cost of gasoline. So it's still significant savings over a fossil fuel right. vehicle. I, I was trying to figure out how you landed on $16 an hour. Um, and I must admit that I did some calculations of what the taxes are uh, to fill up a car, a 45 liter car, I figured it out. Actually, it's very interesting to 1575 an hour in terms of the federal excise tax, the provincial tax, and the TransLink tax. Now, I don't know if that was your equivalent, how you landed on that. I'd be curious as to know as how you did. But um, I want to make the point or ask you the question, if it was in any way thinking about, well, people are paying a portion of their gas price to support Support public infrastructure, including transit. Um, you know, we're probably not going to be able to win that battle of funding um, infrastructure in the future through an EV charge. It's going to have to be some other way. But you may have a different opinion. Uh, that, that is a very complicated question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, there, right now, there isn't a translink tax on, on electricity, and so you know, that may come down the road. Uh, what we would really like to see is actually to have the private sector take on operating the infrastructure down the road, uh, what we need to get to first. For the charging that. stations? Yeah, down the road. We would, it would be, I, I think, preferable to have a, a business case where there are businesses that can operate it. But right now, other, other than a local government, you're not allowed to charge money for electricity. Sorry, do you want to? Sure. Mr. Leclerc. <laughs> uh, me again, Director of Transportation, Lana Claire. Uh, just uh, mo uh, for TransLink, the the issue of mobility pricing is going to be the way that we have to charge for road use, because ultimately, as our vehicle fleet switch from gas powered to electric, uh, TransLink will have lost a huge portion of revenue, which is road charges uh, amounting to about 25 to 30 percent of their revenue, and so that needs to be replaced. And that's where we would see mobility pricing as a way to replace that. Okay. Thank you, okay, Councillor Carr. I'm out of town. I have. Councillor Di Genova. 
Thank you. I had some follow-up questions to what Councilor Carr was asking. It just seems a little backwards to me that we would be trying to encourage people to purchase electric vehicles, and then we would be actually charging them more. So, for instance, I, I have some friends that are rather cheap when they come into Vancouver, and they will actually park five, ten blocks away uh, to avoid a meter, to park in like a two-hour parking zone or whatever it is, or you know, do things like that. So my question is, uh, people with a electric vehicle might not be able to do that. They have to charge. So they're being forced to essentially park at these spaces. And we're not just charging the meter rates, we're charging more than that. So I know you answered Councillor Carr's question to that, but considering the significant investment that we made in Moby Bike here at City Hall and at as a council, I'm just wondering why we wouldn't make that same investment in charging people the meter rate to actually park their cars and use that road space, but to charge their vehicles, we'd be charging them extra. Or would we at least be offering a free alternative a short distance away where it's not in the core of downtown or where our most expensive parking meters are? There, there certainly are uh, free alternatives. There are a number of uh, shopping malls for example, uh, that, that still do offer um, free charging if people choose to use it. Um, but our goal is to really make sure that those stations are available to people. And if they're full all the time, then that's actually probably a much larger barrier to adoption than, than having them. That being said, we do expand, plan on expanding our infrastructure as well under the strategy to make it more available to people. And that will also affect behavior. And the metrics, Councillor Carr quoted it, I have family members that own electric vehicles and I'm just wondering for these charge stations, are they fast charge stations? Would someone be able to pay eight out of the $16 uh, for 30 minutes at the station and have a full charge? Or are these stations, do they take hours to charge a car? Both, both types are affected. So we are proposing a rate of $2 per hour for the level two, which is the, the slower one in the public realm, and then a fast charger, uh, which is the $16 per hour. Um, and so, they'd both be affected and, and essentially you would only pay for the, the time that you're plugged into the station. Okay. And then for road use, do we include that in the fee that Moby bike users pay? I mean, a parking stall in the city of Vancouver, I calculate it into, I mean, streets versus private property. You're up looking at $50,000 at least for one stall downtown, up to $70,000 depending on where you are. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering for Moby Bikes, we took away a number of parking street parking stalls and did we calculate that price into the price per use or the membership of Moby Bikes? I'm not able to answer that. Jerry, if you'd like to address the Moby question. So part of the contract with Vancouver Bike Share is a reimbursement for uh, uh, some of the lost parking charges. Do we know how much of the lost parking charges? I can get that information to you. That would be great if you could send that over to me. I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, several hundred thousand dollars a year, but we'll, I'll, I'll send that to you. But that could be six parking stalls, <laughs> considering the cost of a parking stall. So I just, I'd be interested to know how many parking stalls have been taken away, uh, if possible. If you wouldn't mind sending me over the, or not taken away, I jump or being in. used um, for Moby. Councillor, all of that information is in the council reports that were approved. So I just, didn't, we'll, we can send you the links to those reports, but council approved every spot that was removed and the pricing structure was included in the contract so we can send that along i just like to compare it to this yeah. we'll send you we'll send you links to the reports okay. but i do want I, I really want to clarify the point though what we're trying to do what we're finding is that there are limited places to plug in in an ev downtown because they're free right now if you have an ev you park there and you can stay there for hours and hours and so what we're trying to do by bringing in pricing is to encourage people that need them to charge and then move on so that those, those spaces are available to somebody else. Because what we're finding is, is that if, you, if you're downtown, you want to charge, you go to the location, the, the, the one that was mentioned in Yaletown, those two locations are, you got someone that's parked there, and they could stay there for hours because they're, they're basically not being charged for that charging. So we want to make sure that we're getting people cycling through and those spaces are available to people that need them. Can I ask then why instead there wasn't more of an incentive instead of charging people where if someone parks in a two-hour free parking area, and there are some in the city of Vancouver, two hours or a certain limit, they get ticketed if they park over that certain amount of time in that free area. Is there a reason we're not doing that instead and saying you can stay here for a limited amount of time and then we'll ticket you? So that would ask people to leave instead of charging them or charging them money for charging their cars. Oh, go ahead. That, that, is, that is one option. 
I mean, our parking programs are a graduated program, and and using time limits is is one way of doing it. It is far more labor intensive for our staff to go out and and check when vehicles originally parked there and go back and check when they've been there for too long. Uh, so sometimes we chalk tires, we record license plates. So it's a very inefficient way of us managing our parking spaces. We we do it in areas where we have a lower demand for parking. But as we move closer to our commercial areas, closer to our downtown core, and we see much higher demand, that's where we switch to a parking meter because it's much more efficient for us to manage the time limits on the space by having a meter that starts when people pay and, and flashes when, when the time expires. So it's possible to do it. It's just far more uh, staff resource intensive. Okay. That's I have more fun. questions. But that's Councillor Jang. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So what I understand from the presentation is that people who own an electric vehicle are quite okay, generally, with the idea of having a time limit. Folks who are considering buying an electric vehicle are saying, oh, I don't know, this is kind of a disincentive. So I'm just trying to square this, put a peg in a square or a square in a peg or whatever the case may be. How are we going to convince people that this is not a disincentive to buy an electric car? Well, I think the reason that disconnect between the prospective user and the, the current users is the current users are experiencing that congestion issue. They're, they're already having to drive around and find a charging station, and, um, and so they're, they're living with that frustration. And, and I think in that context, no one, they never really went into this expecting free fuel. I think the prospective owners are like, oh, well, that kind of maybe takes a little bit of the shine off that penny, but it's not, um, it, it's still significantly less expensive than a fossil fuel vehicle. So if someone's actually running the numbers, there's still a, a long-term savings in owning an EV. Okay, so we're going to explain that a little bit more as we roll this thing out. There will be a significant public education before we actually implement for sure. Oh, good, because I'm, I'm looking at an electric car and I'm saying, well, I'm not sure. So if you convince me, we got it right. Okay. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reimer. <clears throat> uh, Chairperson, I'm prepared to move the motions for the two reports. As I understand it, you'd prefer to do it individually. So I will start with uh, one or RRC, one C, uh, which is the curbside um, charging stations. There's three recommendations. I'm not going to read them all out since you all have them printed out. Given that there have been zero questions from council to staff in relation to this report, I think I will save my remarks for the next item. Okay. Speaking to the motion, which is to adopt recommendations A, B, and C on RR1C. Councillor DiGenova. I was hoping that we could sever recommendation RR1C, please. RR1C. Into three different portions. There's recommendation A, B, and C on RR1C. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Carr, a seconder um, for that separate uh, for the motion by Councillor. I'm um, pardon me. Yes. Would you like to second? Oh, sure. Councillor Carr, we'll I, I will. Thank you. Um, and you know, but I, I, I will, and I, I will speak in support um, of the of the motion. I'm sorry. We are just on one report right now. Are we yes. doing both of them? Which the first one? Okay. There's well, that's the charging. first. The, the first one is. Um, I don't have my question. I don't have a question on the first one. With it, just, just with one exception, to say that, um, that it seems to me that this, it's a small pilot, and so it's good to test these things out. I'm not quite sure how it will work, um, but I think that uh, that there, are, you know, it, it's good for us to be. Uh, trying to solve the problem of people who don't have easy access to EV charging. Um, and in this case, it's a, a small subset of commercial users, residential users, and so a pilot is the way to go on it. And I really hope it works in terms of the um, turnover for the three hours and that the, the owner of either the business or the home does get access um, <laughs> because that kind of might be a problem and I, I'm a bit worried about that. But other than that, I think um, we'll see. We will see and adjust as a consequence. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Move to the voting queue for R1CA. Councillor Ball. Are you in favor? Yes, Eric, there you go. All the votes are in. One opposition, Councillor DiGenova. R1CB.
All votes are in. Again, all in favor except for <coughs> Councillor DiGenova. I'll move to the vote for R1CC. All votes are in and it passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we'll move to the next report, which is RR1D. Councillor Reimer. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, so I am very pleased to rise and move recommendations A, B, and C in report RR1D related to the user fees for city-owned and operated public electric vehicle charging stations. Um, I think probably the most compelling um, words that I might be able to give Council is that back on November 16, 2016, uh, so not that many months ago, we all were in the chambers and we all voted unanimously for the electric vehicle ecosystem strategy, which clearly laid out that fees would be charged as a pilot project uh, on the public charging stations and that indeed it would be the very next step as a result of passing that report. Um, so there is no, it, if there's a reason you're now against fees, um, it would be helpful to know what changed in that interval between passing that report and now. Um, but the question before us, assuming that vote was a, an informed and accurate one as to your understanding of the material at the time, would be whether or not you think these fees are sufficient to achieve the six uh, outcomes that were laid out by staff both at that time and again this time. I am not an expert on utility pricing and I, I know that it is a, a challenging area of expertise. There's so many factors that go into behavior. I would say that I uh, feel that staff have done their due diligence on it. It's a um, a limited pilot and I think given where we are uh, with the um, deployment of EVs it's really the right time to be learning and if it is too high we have options available to us to learn that immediately uh, and if it's too low and people continue to sit at the charging stations for long periods of time we will find that out relatively quickly too. For myself I'd rather get on with finding it out so that as deployment increases uh, we're able to adjust. I would say that if the main factor driving people, sorry that wasn't meant as a pun, um, if the main factor that was encouraging people to adopt electric vehicles was free parking and free electricity we would see millions of them on the roads right now because that circumstance has existed for some time now. So I, I think it's a, I think the issue of access to electricity is really the key here and we're told that when it's free um, that access is limited. So whether or not this is the right amount to be charging is something to be learned through the pilot. Okay, to, and, uh, a seconder for the motion. Second by Councillor Carr. Speaking to the motion. Yes. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Well, I had to really think about this, I, I have to say, and did a lot of research and talking to people because I was a little shocked when I first saw the, the charge, $16 an hour, but as I say, I went, I sort of worked through it. And I also rationalized, and I think it's important for people to know, uh, that it's not going to necessarily be an hour for your fast charge to get your vehicle battery up to the point where you can take off back on the road. Um, so the charge, it won't end up being for most people um, $16. A, very, a full battery charge might take 40 minutes. Um, 30 minutes, 20 minutes might get you there. And um, so it'll be a much lower amount that most people will face. I'm also very um, uh, aware that there's still an inequity out there. So I really think we need to move very diligently and quickly on finding solutions for MERBs, for multi-unit residential buildings, um, in, in uh, assuring that there is the capacity and um, that might mean our changing our building code as well to increase the number of spaces and new builds, but also retrofitting um, the older buildings that do exist. Um, and, uh, and so that there isn't that inequity um, issue of access. And I am compelled by the questions um, uh, answered by staff uh, in that the big problem is, and I know it to be an access to, um, to electricity, to the charging, um, that we need to do something with the current charging stations in order to ensure that there is more access. That, you know, when you've got lineups, <laughs> and inability to, to get the charge you want just because cars are sitting there, you need to do something about it. So I appreciate the thoughtfulness that's gone into um, to this solution and look forward to the results. And I'm hopeful that if 
if there looks like there might need to be an adjustment to the fee being charged, that staff will come back to us um, earlier than the expected later on report back. Um, uh, you know, it, it, right away it's apparent that this is not working from a public perspective. So um, with all those points, I'm happy to support this. Thank you. Next, Councillor DiGenova. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I've received a number of emails from people who feel that it's a hardship in their neighborhoods that either their storefronts, uh, in front of their storefronts, uh, certain areas have been taken up by Moby Bike, uh, and they don't feel they have been consulted on that. I was getting to my point, but if I'm allowed to call a point of order that quickly, as people get to their point, I'll remember that. I'll take note of that. Um, so. What concerns me here is it, it seems to me to be unfair uh, that we would subsidize one and not subsidize the other. Uh, so especially for people who choose to have the greenest type of vehicle, which is an electric vehicle at the moment, uh, well, if they're not taking a bike, if they can't bike, then I think that it's fair, not necessarily to subsidize them, but uh, perhaps there are other ways to incentivize uh, them removing their car, such as those zones. I would assume that bylaw officers are already going by the meters that are next to these EV charging stations, and that it wouldn't be too much more work for them to walk by those two or three stations. Um, so I find that $16 an hour, especially, is uh, that's quite a lot of money for someone. Although they might not be spending it on gas, why should they be paying it to the city of Vancouver? And I also understand that the cost of an electric vehicle, just as we saw with hybrids when they came out, was more. But people see it as an investment because they won't be paying more in the future. Uh, for gasoline prices. So for that reason, and truly in considering the report of the greenest city, and if we're going to be subsidizing Moby Bike, I think that it's fair to subsidize uh, to some extent until we come up with other options, such as incentivizing people to move or ticketing them for not moving in a certain amount of time, uh, that we wouldn't be charging them six, up to $16 an hour and not giving them another sustainable alternative, which could be a shopping mall all the way across town. So for those reasons, I just can't support the amount. But I, I very much do thank staff for their a explanation to me as to why they're doing this. I just, um, I'm not sure that people will understand this until they get to some of those charging stations. And uh, as with gas stations, gas stations are being phased out in the city of Vancouver. We see that in the downtown core, there was one left. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, it'll be interesting to me to see what the reaction is to people uh, on this. That being said, I think we have to consider the fact that uh, the real estate of parking spaces in the city is precious. I, I know that uh, people go round and round blocks looking for parking spaces. Some of those people are senior citizens, some of them are disabled. And for that reason, I think that it's important that we do consider uh, the impact that taking away some of our parking stalls does have. We can move towards a greenest city, but with zero emissions vehicles, if we're truly going to support zero emissions vehicles, we have to have parking for those vehicles. And a number of spots have been removed in our city. So I think it's fair to give uh, people who are driving vehicles, especially zero emissions vehicles, uh, that extra opportunity or incentive, just as we offer to Moby bike users. So for that reason, I unfortunately cannot support the recommendations uh, regarding the fees. Thank you. Okay, some closing words from Councillor Reimer. Um, well, first off, I'm saddened to see the, but not surprised to see the change of heart by Councillor DiGenova from her earlier vote in favor of charging fees to now changing her opinion on it. I would say that uh, there is no zero emission vehicle. It's not a possible state for a vehicle because the embodied energy in production and transportation of the vehicle to the end user uh, renders it a quite significant emissions um, item. So hopefully we offset some of that by using electricity, um, but it's certainly not comparable to a much lighter form of transportation. Um, I did myself receive zero emails regarding this report from business owners, so as per usual, I would love to have them shared if possible. But regardless, I did receive two from individuals, two emails uh, from individuals. 
who didn't understand the pricing structure and how it would relate to their particular electric vehicles. So I did want to thank staff. I sent them both here this morning and had answers within less than an hour. And I think at least one of them was answered on the Canada line back from CBC by Mr. Neville. So thank you very much for the speedy response. The vehicle owners, both of the, the emails I did receive, the vehicle owners felt um, quite comforted by the response. And I just wanted to offer that appreciation in public. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Reimer. We'll move to the vote. Recommendations ABC on RR1D. All votes are in. And the motion passes with only Councillor DiGenova in opposition. We'll now move to consider the reports held for debate or for questions to staff. The first report that was held was Administrative Report 1, held by Councillor Reimer. Councillor Reimer. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I have an amendment to this report, uh, which is all related to the financial items and therefore the motion itself, which approves the financial items. So the original report, the cost was $1,725 to attend the North American uh, Renewable Sorry, I don't want to get this one wrong. North American Dialogue on 100% Renewable Energy in Cities. Uh, thanks to a generous grant from the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. And uh, also, I realized that the conference providers had booked me into a hotel that is significantly more than I myself would pay for accommodation. So I have found much cheaper accommodation nearby the conference. Uh, so the result of that is that the request goes from $1,725 down to $380. There's the amendments to the report that was previously distributed to you. If there's no other discussion on that, we'll move to a vote. Oops. Moved by Councillor Reimer and seconded by Councillor Jang. Councillor Affleck is not in the chambers, so therefore all votes have come in and it is a unanimous vote. <clears throat> Next item that was held was policy report number two by Councillor Meggs. Question that uh, I've explored with the clerk and I want a council to hear it, but also um, I have some content based ones too. So. I was contacted when I was uh, reaching out to the um, people who I was working with when this was brought to the planning stage about access to the public hearing for people with disabilities, particularly seeking accommodation that those who uh, needed to book transportation could be given more certainty about when they would speak so they could be given priority perhaps after the, community, the advisory committee members and before members of the general public. Uh, the second question was could the uh, rule be varied that restricts uh, the delivery of notes on behalf of another person in this case because uh, that would be the most comfortable way in this circumstance for some people to make their submissions although they would be present so uh, just about to ask the question and I see I may not have the undivided attention <laughs> Ms. McKenzie anyway um, so I, so Ms. McKenzie I've shared this with you you've had a chance to discuss it with your staff can you just tell council what approach you would recommend to ensure there's maximum access to the public hearing Yes, in terms of um, uh, allowing another individual to, uh, to read, uh, have a speaker read another individual's comments, what I would recommend is that under the procedure bylaw, section 18.14, the chair can modify the procedures if deemed appropriate, appropriate subject to uh, uh, a vote of two-thirds members to supersede the chair. So it's a simple majority to, to or actually the chair can rule uh, that um, that uh, a rule be changed to make this accommodation and the rule that would be modified in this instance would be 18.20 and under 18.20 um, if you recall it, it's the rule where if there is a speaker uh, if a speaker is to speak on behalf of three or more persons or organizations uh, they may do so provided those individuals are present. So that rule would be modified to allow a speaker to speak on behalf of 
one other person provided that individual was also present. So they would be, in it, through that rule, uh, or through this uh, procedure or process, it would allow an individual to, to read the comments for, uh, for uh, one of the uh, Pearson Dogwood residents, as an example. Okay, and then the other question was uh, <coughs> more certainty about speaking time. It's the only item that night, I understand, so people could be given pretty high degree of certainty if uh, we could make the arrangements that they would be able to come in quite early on the top of the agenda, not spend that, hours waiting to book special transportation. That is correct. Um, the, uh, as it stands, uh, the, um, that item, and I don't expect that it'll change, is the only play, um, item on the agenda that is likely to take, that will be taking place on July 18. So as such, the public hearing will start at 6, and so uh, that would be the one and only item that Council was consider considering that evening. So I just wanted that to come to Council's attention so people were worried about that, and if there's any way that we can then advise the specific uh, stakeholders that have contacted me, that would be great, so that people have the highest possible participation options. So uh, that, thank you for those answers. There are two other questions I'd like to get to quickly. Um, one involves the uh, greenhouse discussion and it's more of a health related one I know that it's not specifically in front of us at the public hearing but there is some mention of it in the report so I guess it's for Ms. Hyde uh, or whoever but basically this was this was an extremely uh, contested discussion at the policy level uh, where there was extreme uh, pressure put on all of us uh, and on coastal health to make sure that there was flexibility in the overall planning to provide for the latest uh, uh, form of housing that's non-institutional for people who need that kind of housing. Um, and, and the greenhouse model is what was cited quite a bit. I see in this um, document that that thinking has evolved to some extent and that there will be uh, certainly a reflection of that decision in the final uh, rezoning, but that there will be uh, options as well to have that housing evolve over time if, uh, if care models evolve as well. Is that, is that fair to say? Sure. Uh, Susan Hayde, Assistant Director of Planning for Vancouver South. Um, you'll see in the report that we attach the consensus agreement, which includes a reflection on the uh, proposed model of, of care, including uh, reflection on the greenhouse model. Um, we did get support from the Persons with Disability Advisory Committee and other committees on the um, on the report and the attachments and reiteration of the consensus agreement. Uh, but we will provide fulsome information at the hearing to that effect. And uh, Graham Winterbottom may have additional comments to add at this time. Yeah, thanks. I'll just also add um, some of the language around greenhouse model. VCH has indicated that that is actually a, a trademark term in the United States, so they've amended some of their language. It's, it's a similar model, um, but they've changed the language to a different descriptor rather than greenhouse model, so they'll be at hand at public hearing and they can explain what that model is. I just want to be sure that Coastal Health is on board with this and has seen it and understand that it'd be on their it's their responsibility to deliver the healthcare care solutions in this rather than the city to adjudicate which is the best model. Yep, we work very that. closely with VCH uh, at all levels um, through the development of their models of care and support, and they've been with us all along, and it's, it's theirs to represent at public hearing. Okay, thanks. My last question is, uh, I had an old friend reach out to me yesterday whose uh, partner has been uh, dealing with uh, various conditions over the course of his life which have required medication that have uh, caused severe disabilities. And that strong pool is an, um, an unbelievable asset for him. The only place where he can, uh, he's very, very sensitive to cold. And uh, so the extra warmth plus the wheelchair accessibility of the pool makes it uh, a unique asset in the city. And, uh, and the report reflects that to a degree. Will you have information available at the hearing? Or I would like you to have information at the hearing confirming that this, the outcome of this process will be such a pool in, in an appropriate location because there seems to be a little bit of room there for a, a, a no pool outcome, which I think people would find devastating. Sure, the report does outline uh, the commitment for the pool, which was an obligation of the policy statement. We have been in discussions with both VCH as well as the pool user groups and the stakeholders, um, but we'll bring in more information as part of our presentation and answer those questions. Yeah, I could imagine stakeholders saying that they would like to see that commitment and uh, reinforced at the public hearing so that we don't approve a rezoning and see three to five years of construction at the end of which uh, it turns out no, no option was found. 
I think that given uh, the community we're dealing with and the extents of their requirements, uh, that we're going to have to resolve that pretty close to up front and not uh, drift along as we had to on the social housing front for years, hoping that some other level of government would step in and that kind of thing. So I believe, knowing some of these folks as I do, that the, the needs they have, that we should have some more certainty on that front if we can have it at the public hearing. Thanks. Yeah, I'm happy to move it when. OK, thank you. Councillor DiGenova. Thank you very much. As a liaison to the Persons with Disabilities Advisory Committee, but also as someone who, uh, wearing another hat, as I know other councillors do here, I work with a number of people who have accessibility issues. And over the years, that's had a huge impact on me. I understand that it's not just the people at Pearson Dogwood that use that pool. It's uh, people attending GF Strong, the i -Cord Center, people living in their own independent living facilities or shared care facilities throughout the city of Vancouver. So I was hoping that you'd be able to elaborate. I understand we've been talking about a pool, but will this pool have all of the same benefits such as the heating, the wheelchair accessibility, and will it be especially only for 100% of the time persons with disabilities? I think that that's a big question because to say you can use it from this time to this time and then it's pool hour for everyone else, I, I think has, has certainly caused the disability community some confusion. There's been some miscommunication and misinformation out there about that and I hear that as a liaison to the Persons with Disabilities Committee. Certainly, yeah, we have heard that the pool is a priority for both Pearson residents as well as a strong regional user base. So we'll, we'll illustrate that further when we come back to public hearing. Okay. And right now, uh, is the, you had mentioned that the pool is included. Does it have all of those features that I had just mentioned? Will it, will it mirror the pool that is currently available? And if not, be, bet, be better and available on a basis to, to the types of people who, who so need it first? Sure, the application currently reflects uh, current standards, which includes all the things you mentioned, such as wheelchair ramps, uh, minimum water temperatures, lifts, et cetera. And as I've been asked, I have to ask this question, the pool will be on site, on site at Pearson Dogwood. So there's language in uh, the report that there's still an obligation on site for the pool. It allows some consideration with um, legal commitments that it could be explored in partnership with another organization on another site. And so we'll, we'll discuss that and illustrate it further at hearing. Okay, will it only be discussed at hearing or will staff be bringing a recommendation regarding that? It's hearing? included in the conditions of rezoning and we will, as part of the presentation, we'll explain that fully. And right now has staff decided on that? We've retained the commitment to do it on site, which was as per the policy and that's our, um, that's our direction. Okay, thank you. Another question is the greenhouse model, uh, which, and I, and I understand that the, the vote regarding this coming to council was not unanimous at the Persons with Disabilities Advisory Committee. So I'm, I'm just wondering, and I know that sitting through this term and also last term as a park board commissioner on the Persons with Disabilities Advisory Committee, that the greenhouse model uh, to some could be viewed as a mini institution. Uh, that being said, if people choose to want to live there, that's their choice. Uh, for their living situation. Uh, will these greenhouses be stacked and how many units will be included per greenhouse unit? I, I understood that it was, it started at six to eight, then it, it went up to 12. Sure, I don't have offhand the details of how each model is configured. It is four to six and six to 10, um, but VCH will be here and they, they will be able to, to discuss that in detail. And another question I have is, will each, uh, I, I understand that Vancouver Coastal Health had an agreement uh, with the current residents of George Pearson, Pearson Dogwood, uh, on site, that they would have a choice whether or not they remained on site during construction or if they were moved off site. Will uh, the application that's coming to us fulfill that request of each person? And I believe there were over 100. Uh, that were asked, but some chose to remain on site during construction. Will they be able to do that still? Remain on site? Yes. Yep, so the report outlines uh, what would be required and how the residents would either remain on site or move, and so we can, we can discuss that fully. So each individual will still be able to direct their own care and make that decision? I've received questions on yep. this. Yep, correct. Yeah. Clarify. Thank you. And then, uh, thank you so much. I have procedural questions uh, 
for the clerk. I know Councillor Megs had mentioned that it takes hours to book. Actually, it takes up to weeks to book a handy dart sometimes. So I'm just wondering if we would be able to clarify for people. I know that the Vancouver Park Board has begun to do this after its 3.30 in the morning meetings. Uh, will we be able to clarify for people at the very least what day they're speaking on? or allow them to speak on that day. So for instance, we may have a number of people, if there's over 100 residents at Pearson alone, or other individuals who are using HandyDart, we might not be able to get through those individuals all in one night. Would we be able to then at least, at the very least, tell them what night they would be speaking on? Councillor, um, the in terms of the speakers, when people uh, sign up to speak, it's. It's a matter. It, it it will actually be a matter uh, before council as to as to when they adjourn. And um, you know, if um, we go through these speakers sequentially, and um, if individuals aren't present, essentially it's up to council to make that determination. It's not something that uh, my office has any sort of authority over uh, prior to to the meeting. It will be up to council. Thank you. Thank you. Essentially, it comes down to a couple of factors, if I might. Whether the speakers arrive uh, and are available to speak, whether or not there are questions to those speakers or not, and the number of speakers uh, that uh, have questions to them uh, from the number of councillors. And so all those permutations, of course, will determine the length of time that it takes to proceed through the list of speakers. So it's near impossible for the clerk to answer the question in a definitive way. Councillor Carr. Yes. What I can say is you have five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that clarity. Um, my, uh, I, have, I have questions that, uh, that I think you've answered well enough, but um, I do have a set uh, actually written out that I, I can email you if I don't get through them all, if that's okay. That'd be great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip the ones on the greenhouse model and the therapeutic pool because they've been covered. Um, but I want to know how the FSR was calculated and whether or not the FSR specifically was tied to the um, a station at 57th Avenue on the Canada Line. The uh, reason I raise that is because we've had some correspondence um, that uh, there was a community advisory group that was told the FS, this is back in 2012, 2013, that time period, that FSR will be generous based on that 57th Street, 57th Avenue station. So uh, I'm seeking clarity on that. Um, I'm also wondering, uh, because the report somehow states that it's a transit-oriented location or site because it's within 800 uh, meters to 1,000 a, a meters a kilometer of two other stations on the line, I need to know what, how we assess how accessible a transit-oriented site is, if we have some standard for that. Um, third, have we done a cumulative impact study of the growth of population and use along the Canada line? And I'm talking from Richmond on because obviously by the time it gets to this portion of line, either, well, especially going downtown, um, I'm concerned that we're already at capacity. And, and if we could particularly even include the fact that there may be more cars on this line with the implementation of um, the mayor's um, transit plan. I, I still need to know how it meshes. Um, yes, uh, regarding the therapeutic pool, the one pool, the one thing that I that I didn't hear mentioned, but certainly twigged me in the report, was the mention of capital concerns by Vancouver Coastal Health. And um, so, uh, I'd like that. I'd like that more fully explained. What those sure, cat, right? Certainly. Um, the applicants offering 141.9 million in community amenity contributions, most of it for affordable housing. If you could give me um, a sense of what affordable means, like what, or how loose are the plans right now, or how firm are those plans around the affordability levels? Um, 
And finally, what is the, the I noticed that there are dirt parcels <laughs> included in the community amenity contributions, some of which are not in the community amenity summary um, in appendix whatever it is, H or something like that. Um, so for example, um, there was a statement earlier in the report about park space, urban farm, and uh, the 57th uh, Avenue station, but they are not listed in the public, be oh, it's Appendix I, Public Benefit Summary. And I'm just, I'm wondering why not. They're in one part sure. of the report, not the other. Okay. Those, those are my questions. I'm happy to actually send them so you've got them in full. Sure, that would be great. That's great. Okay. List. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Affleck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I th I'll just pick up uh, where Councillor Carr was going. I I think it's we've heard a lot from, from some people who are concerned about uh, the transit, uh, the TransLink, and the relationship. And obviously, in the report, it talks about the money that's going uh, uh, into the bank, kind of thing, and then maybe, but maybe pulled out eventually. Perhaps as part for clarity, I know how TransLink uh, makes decisions, which is generally whites the eyes until you have people in a community they, they don't make that decision based on per, the way we might like them to. But perhaps you can uh, clarify that. Um, as Councilor Carr kind of touched on some of their reasoning, but given that there is a relationship with the provincial government in this facility and TransLink and uh, how all those things might work together and perhaps how we might be able to encourage TransLink to move faster on a station there, I'm not sure. Um, but perhaps the general philosophy of how TransLink makes decisions and why that we have no, it touches on it, but maybe help us understand it or the neighborhood understand a bit more on that. Um, and then I think uh, there have been questions about the value of the, the CACs and whether or not they are adequate. So I'm not sure why people are asking us that, but perhaps we can provide some clarity on the original report and what this report, if there's some, any way to define it more clearly so residents understand uh, what we're getting and why there's a difference or why there's not a difference. Or if, if the overall value is adequate or the items contained within it. I guess both. I think yeah. you're asking both. Sure, certainly. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Affleck. Staff will endeavor to answer those questions and get something back to us at public hearing. Councillor Meggs has moved and uh, Councillor Jang has seconded. We'll move to the voting queue on that, I guess. We have Councillor, everybody that's in the room to vote has voted and it is unanimous. Thank you. Those are the items that were held. Now we have bylaws. We have 31 bylaws on the agenda for consideration by Council. Does any member wish to hold any of the bylaws for debate, separate vote or conflict of interest? Say none, we'll proceed. Bylaws. 26 through 29, council members who are not in attendance at related uh, at the related meetings may only vote on these bylaws if they now confirm that they reviewed the, the proceedings, which includes viewing the related video clips. Under bylaw number 26, a public hearing enactment bylaw uh, from a public hearing held on June 13th, 2017. Councillor Di Genova, you were absent from that hearing. Have you reviewed the proceedings and will you be voting on the bylaw? Yes, let me get your mic. Yeah, there you go. Did you just speak into the mic? Oh, I did. Oh, maybe it wasn't on. Uh, no, I haven't and I won't. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have bylaw 27 through 29, uh, which were at a public hearing enactment bylaws from a public hearing held in September the 16th, 2014. Councillor Jang was absent from the hearing and Councillor DiGenova was not on council at that time. Councillor Jang, have you reviewed the tapes and proceedings of the hearing and will you be voting on the bylaws? I have and I will. Okay, thank you. Councillor DiGenova? I was not on council at the time and I won't. So you, okay. So the question was, have you reviewed the proceedings and will you be voting on the bylaws? I understand that that's the proper term I can use from the clerk from speaking to them before. So no, I was not on council at the time and no, I won't. Okay, so just answer, answering the question. I didn't know that you weren't on council. Okay, so would someone like to move adoption of the bylaws one through 31? Adoption. It's moved and seconded. I will call the votes. Should we go to a voting queue? 
No? No. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries for those that are eligible to vote on the appropriate bylaws. Administrative motions. We have two administrative motions, which I will move. And <sighs> Councillor Reimer had signed, but... Oh. So is it all right if we proceed without her in the chambers? Councillor Deal will we'll adjust that. Councillor Deal will now second the motions. Uh, we'll move to the vote. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Next, we have support for Chinese Cultural Center space, which I will move. Second. Councillor Jang has seconded. We have request, received requests to speak to the motion. Uh, should Council wish to hear from the speakers, we can refer the motion to the Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities meeting, which is held tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Moved referred by Councillor Deal, seconded by Councillor Jang. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries. So we'll bring that back to hear from speakers. <clears throat> Second motion has been withdrawn by Councillor Carr. The third motion uh, on notice was change to Council Liaison for Chinatown area uh, and Chakpak, which I will move. Councillor Jang is second. And is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? That carries unanimously. We have a number four, request for leave of absence from Councillor Meggs for meetings to be held on July 27th. Would someone like to move that? Moved by Councillor Deal, second by Councillor Jang. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Number five, the one we've been waiting for. <laughs> this is the banning of pets and retail from retail outlets, which has been moved by Councillor Deal and seconded by Councillor, was that Councillor Carr? Oh. Councillor Meggs is seconded already? Okay. Then we uh, have re re received requests to speak to the motion, uh, should it, we wish to hear from these speakers, I will require a mover and a seconder to refer to tomorrow's meeting. Moved by Councillor Deal, seconded by Councillor Meggs. Uh, all in favor, any opposed, that carries. We'll hear from speakers tomorrow. This section now is notice of motion, new business inquiries and other matters. We have two items. Um, first is, a leave of absence for Councillor Jang for a public hearing of July the 20th. Would someone like to move that? Moved by Councillor Ball, seconded by Councillor Deal. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Second is, I think, we have a leave of absence for Councillor Affleck. For, for a leave of absence for personal reasons from the beginning of the Standing Committee of uh, tomorrow's meeting, July 28th, 2017. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Uh, okay. It says here we have a s another piece of new business from Councillor Deal. Where is it? This, and here it is. All right, Councillor Deal. Yes, thank you very much. <coughs> I stand with a notice of motion, which I'm hoping we can deal with today. Um, and there's a much truncated version of it uh, to comply with UBCM regulations. If people need that in print, I think we have a few copies, but it's been emailed to all of you. Um, I rise supporting this motion. It came out of our Food Policy uh, um, Council, which, as you know, is an extremely high-functioning, very active group of people, and they've been working for a long time on this. And they worked really hard to make sure it got passed last week so that we could bring it to council this week and get it uh, by the June 30th deadline to UBCM in time for the fall. So the, uh, you've seen the long version of the motion. It's very self-explanatory. But one of the things that's really important about getting this passed now is that the federal government is un currently undergoing a food policy for Canada consultation process. And in fact, they had a summit this last weekend that the two co-chairs of our Food Policy Council attended. And I'm looking forward to their, their, uh, their motion back to us or their, their report back to us on that. We all know the data. There are an enormous number of children and families living at risk of food security or lack thereof. And we also know the data that says that if kids go to school hungry and stay hungry throughout the day, not only do they not learn well, they end up with less healthy lifestyles overall. And if we can get all of those kids to have a healthy food at some point during their day at school, 
<clears throat> not only, do, again, do they learn better, but in fact, the cost of society drops, whether it's through the healthcare system, the judiciary system, or elsewhere. These are people who are more likely to thrive, do well at school, and as a result, do well in society as adults. So the, uh, the chain of, of evidence is extremely strong for the importance of children all having healthy school food available. And I think what's really interesting about this motion uh, and this movement that's coming through from the Coalition of Healthy School Food, which is over 30 organizations across Canada, is that they also acknowledge that what, what feels like comfort food or healthy food or, or food you're familiar with is different for a lot of the children here in Canada. We have people from all over the world living here as Canadians and as residents. And so part of the program is to educate people and to make sure that food that's appropriate for them is available. Now this is not starting from ground zero. There are a lot of really great <laughs> programs throughout the country already. Right here in Vancouver, we've got some real leadership programs. So working with the school board that was, um, bringing forward funding for healthy breakfasts in many of our schools uh, supported here by the city of Vancouver. We have our Healthy City Action Plan with a significant amount of information about the importance of food security and healthy food for children. The Vancouver Food Strategy, again, uh, a very important document. And even in Greenest City, it talks about local food. We heard updates today and also about the importance of not wasting food. So one of the best uses we can have of both our resources and existing food is to make sure that kids get healthy food on a daily basis. So I'm hoping that we can all support this here today, get this off to UBCM, and get it into the FCM roster as well as to the federal government in a timely fashion for their current uh, the current work that they're doing, uh, consulting around the food policy for Canada. I think it's extremely relevant. There's a lot of work to be put together that's already on the ground, needs to be tied together, supported, and made into a universal program across the country, as most industrial countries already have. So I'm hoping we'll have full support for this today. Okay, well said. It's been moved by Councillor Deal and seconded by Councillor Carr. If there's no further speakers, then we'll move to the vote. All votes are in. It is unanimous. So hopefully we'll get that passed to UBCM as well. Okay. We are still under new business inquiries and other matters. I see no one else on the queue. So we can, oh, Councillor Carr. I just kept on going. Councillor Carr. I will be very brief. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. I, I really just wanted to do a couple of congratulations. Um, first of all, to all of those people who put the incredible amount of energy necessary into uh, mounting our car-free days. Um, on Main Street and on the West End. Uh, the one at Commercial Drive is coming up in July, but they were fabulous events despite the fact they were a little bit chilly, uh, but didn't stop the crowds of Vancouverites from coming out. And uh, they were really, really were wonderful family-oriented events that uh, I think people really enjoyed. And I know it took a lot of volunteer effort to do that. Um, also, uh, my congratulations to um, uh, uh, the Dragon Boat Racers. Um, I did go down and, and attend some of that, watch some of the races. Fabulous and looking forward to that creek getting cleaned up even more. And, uh, but it, it looked to me like a, it was a very safe event and again tons of participants so uh, thank you to all those who were involved in that and also to Open Doors Vancouver. I think some of us were here in chambers and I thought you might be curious when I, I gave a little presentation, some of you also gave presentations. One of the most interesting questions I got was how long does it take you to read your reports that go to council? Interesting question for And your answer us. was? I said, it depends on the thickness of the report. It varies from time to time, but sometimes it's this thick. Um, and finally, uh, just in anticipation of Canada Day coming up on July 1st, and to, uh, to remark again that I'm so proud of our city for doing the 150 plus uh, Canada Day celebration, and, um, and just want to remark on how how important it is to me that we celebrate the diversity um, that we have within our country. Um, not only the Indigenous and First Nations diversity, but the cultural diversity and diversity of peoples who make up this phenomenal country that I, am, um, I feel so privileged uh, to be able to serve within. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Yes, there's uh, obviously a number of events that happened around the city. Uh, although your comments around the Dragon Boat did um, spark uh, for me to, to remember to make mention that again there were uh, a number of vessels one in particular that was um, 
in conflict with the race course uh, right adjacent to it and created some challenges both on the first and second and third day. Um, and if we could get an update on our progress on on trying to find a way to better regulate the space and move some of these vessels uh, in the area. Um, not necessarily today, if you're not ready, but uh, certainly at uh, some council meeting soon. Well, happy to just, I mean, we, we sent a memo to you quite recently just on our efforts in that regard. So we are working on it. It's outside of our jurisdiction. So we, I met with officials in Ottawa when I was there a few weeks ago, and we are trying to move that conversation forward. But at this point, we don't have any further information to report other than that we're working on it and it's not in our jurisdiction. Yes, unfortunately the uh, the minister and I did not, uh, weren't quite able to cross paths. I know that uh, the minister was, was there as well, but unable to, to make contact. But um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Deal. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't mention it earlier, but uh, um, I think many of us have seen the flyer for the Chinatown history windows. The uh, 22nd of them was installed, the 22nd or 23rd was installed uh, yesterday in the Van City building on Kiefer. Uh, Kiefer Pender. Uh, I'll have to check. Um, uh, Kiefer. And it's, uh, they're just fabulous. They're, they're Pender. Pender. Pender, thank you. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, and, uh, and they're fabulous windows uh, that, that show images from the history of Chinatown along with descriptions about uh, what we're seeing there. And they've not only brought a lot of interest to people going down to Chinatown now just to see these and to read about the history, but there also uh, there have been some empty storefronts and these are now in the storefront windows, although hopefully those storefronts are filling quickly. So I would uh, recommend that people go down and see this. And it was also curated, by the way, by our, our ex-head uh, of communications here at City Hall, Catherine Clements. So we're very proud of her work and uh, and, and it's a fabulous display throughout Chinatown, well worth a walking tour. Okay, Councillor Deal, you'll move adjournment? I will. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Remember that we are have committee committee tomorrow and in camera tomorrow as well.